بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Welcome back to part two of uh, our series with Sayyid Hussein Al-Ghazwini who is gracing us here in the center for the first two weeks of Shahar Ramadan um, Assalamu alaikum Sayyidna, how are you? Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah, Allah yahfadkum inshallah So we felt that uh, last episode we started talking about the role of the English member We covered, you know, um, kind of the, the topics that you choose, your process in coming up with a with a majlis when you're invited in English the issues that English speakers face compared to Arabic speakers. And also we spoke about um, kind of the role of the English member generally and how sometimes it's neglected in the community. We spoke about how some speakers, um, they talk a lot about polemics. And we spoke about how some speakers maybe don't have the same qualifications as others. Um, so we talked about a lot of issues around the English member, and we have more to talk about because, of course, right, we, right, what we're doing right here is speaking, obviously we're not on a member, but we're speaking about Islamic issues in English for an English Shi'i audience. So, uh, of course, this is kind of like the core of uh, our communities, these, these topics. So, just going back to the history of the English member, you are... I think it's one of the earliest, uh, one of the earliest speakers in, in the English language. Allah um, welcome. So, who, uh, when you first started in English, who were you learning from? Was there someone that you were listening to, learning from? Um, of course, you were fluent in English, but that doesn't mean you were necessarily يعني, a khatib in English. So, what was that process like? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين. I remember the first time that I gave an Islamic lecture professionally. يعني as as a as a speaker, not you know during high school when you're asked to give a a talk at this event or that event. Or, no no no, but a formal majlis at a mosque. I was 17 years old. I had just graduated from high school and my father asked me to give a talk in English. His talks would be in Arabic and Farsi and he would translate Arabic and Farsi on and off. So he asked me to speak in English and I remember my first talk was just five minutes. I couldn't do any anymore. I, I was... Uh, I was very scared. I was very nervous. I didn't know what to talk about. I didn't know what people were going to think or say. And I'm in the presence of my father. And he's in the audience as well. So I have to make sure I don't make a single mistake. I recite the verses correctly. I recite the narrations correctly. Uh, the way I analyze or explain a hadith, I don't make a mistake. And he's listening attentively. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. And I'm speaking to an audience that have been listening to my father for many years. So what can, what can I possibly add? What can I uh, say that will increase their knowledge? I remember I had a book called A Bundle of Flowers. And then I came to know that several other speakers, uh, they had this book, they made use of it. Um, this book... Whoever compiled it, may Allah bless them. They made my job a lot easier. So it was a book of ahadith. And they were put into categories. For example, ahadith on having good akhlaq. Ahadith on salat al-layl. Ahadith on praying on time. And every category had about five narrations. And every narration is translated into English. So that helped as well for the hadith to be translated in English. And my five-minute talk was basically choosing a topic from this book, A Bundle of Flowers, and bringing one or two hadith, explaining them, giving, giving an example for each hadith, and that's it. And truly, what is better than starting your lecture or having your lecture revolve around the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt? Um, this is what the imams taught us. Imam Rada says, Atajlasun wa tatahadathun. The, the narrator says, yes. And then this says, the Imam, Imam Al-Rudha, he says, 
من تعلم علومنا وعلمها الناس وعلمها الناس learn our hadith and teach it to the people فإن الناس لو علموا محاسن كلامنا لتبعونا if people know our hadith they would follow us I remember visiting a scholar Sayyid Alwi Buru Jurdi he would say that we don't even need to tell people to become Shia just say the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt teach people the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt people will immediately be attracted to the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt so this is how I began and the 5 minute lecture would become 10 the 10 minutes became 15 minutes and so on and so forth and as I would speak I would develop more confidence I would develop more self esteem and the amount of support that I'd received from my father and my older brothers was enormous and that that's what boosted my confidence and I think this is very important for any upcoming speaker to receive encouraging words encouraging words and we have to be careful with with upcoming speakers or those who are speaking for the very first time we don't uh, put them off by saying you know uh, your delivery wasn't great your topic wasn't great you d- you could have done that you stuttered a lot <laughs> you stuttered a lot or you were obviously very nervous these words could s- put them off and they'll they'll never speak again they'll never speak again yeah they'll never speak again we could really boost their confidence by the compliments that we give them so this was in in, two th- in 2000 2001 and I remember being invited by my older brother uh, Sayyid Hassan Qazwini at the Islamic Center of America on Joy Road, the old Islamic the old Center. Yeah. And I was invited for a weekend uh, during Muharram. So I didn't give a, a series that year, the year, t- the year 2000. Uh, I spoke for a weekend. The year 2021 and 2022, I spoke in Muharram uh, before my father. I would give a 20 to 30 minute lecture before my father in English. I think my very first 10 nights of Muharram that I spoke independently where I was the the main speaker was in Michigan, in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, at the Islamic Center of America, in their gymnasium at the Maya School, which Mm -hmm. falls, uh, which is right behind the Islamic Center of America, the current Islamic Center of America, in the gymnasium. That's where they held the 10 nights of Muharram in 2000. 24, where I gave my very first uh, 10 nights of Muharram independently. You know, when I say independently, there was no other speaker after me yeah, to speak. Yeah. So, uh, and that's the headliner. And that's yeah. big because you're the majlis. You're not giving an introduction before anyone else. This culture of introduction it existed in the English majlis. Yeah, I'm sorry, in the Arabic majlis, in the Arabic member. When a speaker, the main event, would big speak, guy. but before him, the big guy would speak, and there would be someone that would give a, an intro called a muqaddimah. And the muqaddimah was simply reciting a qasida, reciting a poem in Arabic. Uh, for example, Fayasa kini ardu tufuf alaykumu salamu muhabbin malahu ankumu sabru. Famous, legendary. A poetry like was this. this person usually a mu'ammam? It was usually a mu'ammam and someone upcoming, becoming a speaker themselves. Okay. In English, unfortunately, we don't have that culture of giving an intro. We have youth lectures. In Majalis, yeah. I've noticed we have youth lectures that will give a five-minute, ten-minute talk. But we don't have the culture of a speaker uh, before becoming the main event, giving that ten-minute, yeah. fifteen-minute talk before the main lecture. I had that advantage in the year 2001, 2002. Before my father, I would give that muqaddimah yeah. in English. And it wasn't ta'ziyah. It wasn't reciting masa'ib only. It was an actually, it was a full lecture, but it was a short lecture. It was a 15, 20 minute lecture. In 2004, I gave the first 10 official full lecture, as in 45 to, to an hour lecture. So it was a, it was an incredible experience for me at the at the YMA the Young Muslim yeah. Association and at the time there were other majalis I remember in the UK in London a major English majlis had had taken off there were no English majalis in London especially in the Iraqi community there were no majalis in the year 2003 
I believe the first official English majlis in the Iraqi community took place uh, at Al Al Bayt uh, with Al Al Bayt Foundation, and the organizer of that majlis was my dear friend, uh, Sayyid Fadl Al Bahr Al Uloom. Uh, he he organized the English majlis, and I believe they rented a hall at Yusuf Islam's hotel on mm. Wilsden Green in, in 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 the heart of the Iraqi community. And the speaker was uh, my dear cousin, Sayyid Mahdi al-Mudarasi. Sayyid Mahdi al-Mudarasi is a pioneer in, in the English member. He's a very profound, very eloquent speaker. He connects with the youth very well. And he took off in 2003 and in 2004. He spoke in, in London. And that, that event attracted a lot, of, a lot of attention, a lot of hype, uh, and uh, it got a lot of other majalis to begin English. It started like a chain reaction. It started a chain reaction in, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, where people really started thinking of an English member, an English majlis. And for the very first time, the maqtal was being read in English. I remember in 2003, I read the maqtal in English. Sayyid al mudarisi in 2003, 2004, he was reciting the, the maqtal in English. And that was hard in itself because we didn't have an English yeah. maqtal. So we had to translate ourselves, take from here, from there, and formulate a maqtal. So I had to formulate a maqtal. That's incredibly difficult because the Arabic maqtal, you know, you're taking it from Sheikh Abdul Zahra. Or maqtal oh. muqarram or yeah. maqtal Sayyid Muhammad uh, Taqi Bahr al Uloom. There are several. Yeah. So we had to choose a maqtal which, which was a mix of all of these maqatil and then find a way to recite it in a new language in a new language yeah. for about 45 to an hour 45 minutes to an hour so I remember the maqtil that I uh, put together I sent it to several other speakers and after many years I heard speakers tell me that we're still using the maqtil that you put together of course that maqtil was also enhanced by others yeah, by others, they took it, they enha yeah. enhanced it, they, they made additions, they added Arabic to it, they added poetry to it. Until recently, uh, our dear brother, Sheikh Usam al-Attar, okay. translated the maqtal of Sheikh Abdul Zahra al-Ka'bi to English, and it's published. And if you read the whole thing, uh, it's, it's a two-hour, two-hour and, two and a half uh, sort of maqtal. Of course, that's a bit tiring. And I yeah. have my own theory on the maqtal. I yeah. believe... We, we experienced it uh, last Muharram Ahsant. when you were here. I believe that when we read the entire maqtal, you know, we've already, in in the nights of Muharram, we've already heard the musibah of Abu al-Fadl Abbas, oh, Ali al-Akbar, al-Qasim, Habib ibn Mudahir. We've already heard these musaib. Everyone is waiting to hear the musibah of Abu Imam Abu Hussein alayhi salam. Now when we do the whole maqtal, and you're crying on the day of Ashura, you hear the musibah of Abu al-Fadl Abbas, you cry. You hear the musibah of al-Qasim, you cry. By the time you get to Imam Hussein, you're out of tears. That's true. You're out of tears, you're out of energy, and you just want to get to the end. Well, I feel the day of Ashura should be dedicated to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We should save our tears for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And what I tend to do is I begin the maqtal briefly with Bani Hashim, so Abu al-Fadl Abbas, Ali al-Akbar, yeah. uh, Al-Qasim, but not in full not detail. Full musibah, yeah. And then I go to Ali al-Azghar, and then we... We put Imam Hussein under the spotlight. We yeah. recite his full musibah. And I usually feel, I, I see, I notice that people are very energetic. They're, they they start yelling, they start shouting, they start crying with full of energy. While when you read the whole maqtal altogether, people are out of energy. And people, yeah. So this was a new experience for me. So we have usually had uh, the two-hour maqtal yes. on, on the 10th. And uh, like once you're after, past Abu al Fadl Abbas, that alone takes you know all your tears. So you're just you kind of almost desensitized. Subhanallah, like it's a sad thing to say, but you're desensitized at the end. Where when you get to Imam Hussein, you're kind of you're out of energy, can't really exclaim or shout or say anything out loud. And your tears, your eyes are dry, Ahsan. and you're tired at at that point. Like you're, you know, you're physically just uh, drained. So it was a new experience to your way. Uh, uh, like a lot of people were kind of like shocked that it, oh it's short because even short. The, even the timing that we placed it at we expected the two hours and then there was gonna be uh like two hours and then a quick yani breakfast and then uh, the horse let out 
something like that. And then, <laughs> although the maktab that I recited wasn't short, it was about forty five. It was forty five minutes short. Forty five short minutes. relative to the two hour one. Right. But yeah, the forty five minutes. I think honestly, I'm on board with your line of thinking now. Like at first, I there was a bit of a question mark. I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily getting it, but uh, I, I I was on board with that. I found it to be a a, a good experience, especially. Yeah, you're just focused on on Imam Hussein. Alayhi faliyabkil baqoon. That was uh, that was something new, I, I, and I I think I agree with your point of view on it. Alhamdulillah. Um, so f- back to the English member. Um, you have like you said a few pioneers. Yes. At the beginning. Absolutely. Th- these were. I mean, these men are the men that established the, the English member. And I think they deserve recognition because they are the pioneers. Um, Can you give us a sure, few of abs- their names? Absolutely. So let's go back 20 years. Yeah. In 2003, 2004. Sorry, just uh, I think that timing is also important. It's that same time is where there was a lot of, um, and I, we're speaking mainly for the, for the Iraqi community because that's where we have the most familiarity. It's when a lot of the immigrants had come in the 80s and 90s to London and also to the U.S. So then once they're, and they had kids that were born there. And now these kids are starting to grow up with the ones that were born in the 80s or early 90s. Now they're grown up by the early to mid 2000s. Like they're still growing, but now they're teenagers or late teens or early 20s. So they're, uh, like now they're starting to see the importance of English. English is their first language. They're born in London or born in Toronto, born in... Detroit or New York or wherever, so I I think that must be like a a big push behind this uh, this trajectory, this sure, shift to the English member. And it was at this time when uh, the English lecture became an actual member. It wasn't a fifteen minute talk yeah. or a twenty minute talk be, before the main Arabic or Farsi or Urdu or Gujarati lecture. No, it became a member of its own where the scholar would sit on the member and would end with Musiba. And uh, that was the main event. So it was around this time, I believe, 2003, 2004, when we see the rise of the English member and it becomes an, an independent entity, not an intro to the, the other uh, live event. It was the, the event, the main event. So I think s- several members deserve pioneers of the English member. They deserve recognition because today we have a lot of new faces and there's a lot of youth that have come today and they're listening to members but they but they don't know the history of the English member and they don't know the pioneers. So for example, Haj Hassanin Rajab Ali. Yeah. Haj Hassanin Rajab Ali, uh, may Allah bless him, he's a pioneer when it comes yeah. to the English member. His, uh, his, his delivery uh, on the podium his eloquence, the examples that he gives, um, the way that youth relate to him, the amount of verses that, he that has he's memorized. that has memorized. It's incredible. And he brings them off the top of his head. On, on the top dime. of his head, he's he has them memorized. I've seen Arabic speakers that haven't don't have Quranic ver, uh, Quranic verses on the top of their memory the same way that Hajj Hassanain Rajab Ali does. Yeah, it's a, incredible. He's a machine. So um, I don't know. So let me be clear. I don't know exactly when did some of these speakers begin speaking. Maybe it was before that. Maybe it yeah. was in the in the late nineties. Yeah. Maybe it was in the mid nineties. I don't exactly know. But it was in the two thousand three two thousand four period where we see them rise yeah. and come to prominence. And there were certain websites that would collect uh, the lectures. Of these speakers, I remember there was a, a website called, I believe, yahusain.com. Uh During Muharram, not Shia at all. <laughs> yeah, they would collect the the the, the lectures from various uh, speakers and put them on. So you'd have them on one website. Hajj Hassanin Rajab Ali was very uh, crucial and influential, and he was a main, he was a pioneer uh, during this uh, period. Said Ammar Naqshawani was a is a pioneer. Yeah. In in the field of English member, uh, he me- I remember he came out at that time, or at least I came to know him during that time. I I think he spoke in, in Dubai or the Emir- Emirates, and Sayyid Ammar. I mean, he's known for his eloquence, for his in depth 
lectures. So he played a major role, and uh, he he's he has been, and and he continues to be an inspiration for a generation of youth. There there are a lot that take you know their knowledge of Islam from him. Yeah, Sheikh Murtaza Ali Dina. Maybe some youth now they they haven't heard of his name, but I remember at that time he was well known. He was very popular. People people would listen to him. Uh, he's a scholar. He's well established, and many found his lectures to be uh, inspirational. My older brother is Sayyid Mustafa Al-Qazwini, yeah. uh, a pioneer when it comes to the English member. He he has a way of relating to uh, the Muslim community in the West. His choice of topics, uh, the the social topics that he addresses, he comes with a lot of wisdom. He comes with a lot of experience. So he puts in a lot of his experience. Because he's a a well-known religious leader in the West. People come to him with with their problems, with their issues. So when he comes to the member and he discusses these social topics, it comes from experience, from, from, exper- from people's questions, from people's problems. So he was... He, he has been, he was, and has been a very successful English speaker and a pioneer in uh, uh, in this field. These these were the pioneers of the English member. Um, maybe there are other names. I hope I'm not leaving anyone else out. But these were the pioneers of the English member that encouraged others to uh, to attend. And some some English speakers today. If you ask them, they will tell you we were inspired by these individuals. They were, we were inspired by them. They heard them when they were younger. When yeah. they were young, they attended their majalis. Today, they're their inspirations. Maybe they even picked up their speaking style from some of the names that I had, uh, yeah. I had, I just uh, mentioned. Yeah, mashallah, uh, all of those names, amazing speakers. Still, uh, most of them still very active today, very popular. Uh, I had I kind of grew up attending uh, Hajj Hassanin's summer camp, which was also a huge initiative for uh, for young Muslims in in the West in North America. I met people that flew in from London to come from Dubai. It was actually it was a it was a great experience attending the Tawhid summer camp every summer, where it was all English and you had people from all kinds of backgrounds. So it was a, a completely different vibe than to what I got in the Iraqi community center that I attended every week and every Ramadan, every Muharram to go there. You're exposed to a kind of a different, different world, different people, different cultures. Uh, so may Allah bless Hach Hassanin for that, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, just to rewind, to uh, you, we spoke about the the book called was it the uh, the bundle of flowers? Yes, a bundle of flowers. A, bu- a bundle of flowers. And it was a collection of English ahadith. Yes. So speaking about, this is a bit of a, a sidestep, but English ahadith, um, there's a lot of translated books. There's like, I think there's a translated version of Aitkafi behind me. Yes. Um, is this, this, I think, is a net positive for like the, the, the community to have these English ahadith translated. But uh, there's also now, like online, or uh, to reference the uh, the hadith of Imam Rula, you said, you know, teach people our hadith. Is just getting, now you, anyone can access this. Like this book is on Amazon, you can get it, English ahadith. They've, uh, people have started to cut out the middleman, let's say. You get the book of a hadith, you read it for yourself, you interpret it the way you want, mm. and you let that guide your life. So why do you need a scholar to sit on a member and explain the hadith to you in a language you now you have it in before people didn't understand uh, even arabs in iraq like they wouldn't understand the the language used in in the ruwayat but when they're translated into english and uh, not all of them are perfect translations of course it becomes incre- like incredibly accessible like for anyone to open a book read it and that's not only shias even people from other sects other religions now they can just buy the hadith book open it up be like Look, your hadith says this. So I wanted to just get your thoughts on the access people have to these hadith books, if it's overall a positive or a negative, um, and whether the 
there is still a need for someone for like to ishrah to explain a hadith and the way it applies to your life because now when you read this it's kind of in plain language in english mm-hmm. um and a lot of people uh you can find them online a lot where they say you know that's it I, I have the hadith and yeah i can they will misinterpret or apply it in a in a way that benefits them first of all I don't think there's any problem with making these books accessible, books of hadith or uh, whether it's our books of fiqh, usul, aqaid, or even the Qur'an. The Qur'an is now translated to English. You could yeah. say the same thing about Qur'an. Is it wise to have the Qur'an translated to English and make it accessible to everyone? Uh, first of all, it's, it's not a matter of is it wise? This is something that will happen no matter what. If we don't translate the Qur'an, others will. If we don't translate our books of hadith, others will. So it's something that you can't beat it. You can't avoid it. It's, uh, we live in a, uh, a time of you know, a wealth of information where knowledge has become very accessible. Knowledge of everything, including religion and schools of thought. So it's a bit naive to, to assume that these books are not going to be translated. If it's not translated by us, it's going to be translated by others. Uh, so this accessibility, it's, it was going to happen no matter what. Is this something positive? It could be. It could be, yes. Uh, people could read the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt, take it, يعني, understand them, benefit from them the same way they would benefit from the translation of the holy quran this doesn't mean when you read the translation that you're going to understand what the hadith means this is at the end of the day the the language of ahlul bayt sometimes the language of ahlul bayt requires contemplation requires understanding the context of the hadith why was it stated in what historical context uh, who was the imam addressing this is this has to be taken into consideration so this is not the job of the lay or your average reader to come and take out Al-Kafi and try to understand it and then ascribe it to the imams immediately. First of all, there's the, the whole issue of chain of narrators, the chain of tra- transmissions. This is the job of scholars and specifically those who have studied al rajal not just any scholar, even those who've studied fiqh and usul. If they haven't studied rajal, they won't be able to tell you whether this chain of narrators and transmitters, is it authentic? Is it not authentic? So this is one. This is the job of, of, of specific scholars, the scholars of al marajal To understanding the words of the imam, understanding its context. What did the imam mean by this? Uh, what is he referring to when he says this? This is also the job of, of scholars who've spent years in understanding the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt and coming across the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt and trying to solve the contradictions between the hadith and, and, trans, and transmissions, it's the job of scholars. It's not the job of, of the lay. At the end of the day, yes, you can read the book, Al-Kafi, but how much are you going to benefit from it? How much are you going to understand from it? Especially when it comes to halal and haram, when it comes to Islamic laws, that's the job of scholars, to come and derive Islamic laws from these hadith. You can't simply pick up a copy of Al-Kafi and say, well, the imam said, so-and-so is wajib, so-and-so is haram. First of all, we have to see, is there a conflicting narration? We have to see, did you understand it properly? Is the translation accurate? How, how accurate is the translation? Who is translating these, these books? And how accurate are they? How precise are they when translating the words of Ahl bayt to say that the imam said, this is wajib, that is haram? A, a single word, in fact, a harakah, a harakah. Is it recited this way or that way? Yadrabu or Yudrabu. Changes the whole it, It's spelled the same, but the harakat are different. It'll change the meaning completely. This is not the job of the lay. This is a job of scholars. So you, we would definitely need ulama to come and explain to us what these narrations mean, what are their connotations. We can't do away with scholars by simply translating these books of hadith. Sahih. Another aspect. And I think it it is more a product of the the English member is the shift to an online space. Mm. So right now, me and you are sitting, we're discussing these topics. This is going to be recorded and shared online. Uh, 
other on platforms it's going to be uploaded on youtube we're going to cut it up and make a bunch of reels out of it um and that's the same thing with your lecture on the member but this is different we're sitting me and you and there's no majlis as well even when there's a majlis there's people sitting and there's a big audience online, online. as well and i think that is primarily a result of us living in the west um of course now the same thing has applied to majlis in the arabic world and in uh wherever it's kind of a global phenomenon but of course the west was kind of the first to adopt these uh online platforms youtube instagram facebook uh now tiktok whatever it is uh to propagate you know a message of ahlul bayt message of islam um i want to discuss first off whether there is a a quality difference between knowledge that is you know do you, do you think it's there's a difference in the quality of knowledge that's obtained or absorbed in person so tonight mashallah you had a lot of shabab sitting in front of you on the floor some take notes um versus the people that are tuning in online they're tuning in at home or they're watching the reels uh th- is there a quality a difference in the quality um of absorption mm-hmm. of knowledge uh of course historically learning has always been done in person that has changed a lot especially post covid uh the online world ha- world has actually probably risen to the forefront even ahead of in person learning and in person attendance so i want to ask you about that this was also something that was inevitable it was going to happen uh we already had an online audience before covid but yeah. obviously during covid and and what happened people tuned in to the online platform um some people simply can't attend they're either working they're at work they have kids that want to sleep early the next day they have school and you just simply can't attend or you're in a different city we have people we have people tuning into our lectures from from the united states from the uk from different places they're watching live or they're watching the recorded lectures so they're simply in another state but um, they're still benefiting. They're still benefiting. There's obviously benefits to listening online. You could stop whenever you'd like. You could fast forward. You could rewind. Obviously, in person, you don't have these features. Yeah. So there's there's points to um, p- positive points. There's advantages to listening online. You could share the lecture immediately. You can pause. You could go to another lecture. Come back to to the to this lecture. And I think you could learn. You could learn a, a, gr- a great deal. You could be typing at the same time. You could be taking notes at the same time when you're listening online. Yes, being in person, obviously, you live the environment. You're not just listening online. You, for you, it's not just a lecture. You're feeling, you're getting the full spiritual experience. You're, you're at a mosque. You're sitting on the floor. You're sitting humbly. There's a mimbar in front of you. When you listen to the musibah, you cry. You, you live the moment. It might be a bit harder when you're listening to a musibah online, right? Uh, you're praying jama'ah before that. After the lecture, you sit and you uh, ask questions. You know, every night when we finish, there's a circle of yeah. brothers that gather around us and they have follow-up questions uh, based on the lecture or based on other lectures or just outside of the uh, lectures. They have questions. You miss, you miss all that online. You don't get that advantage of asking questions. It's just listening to that lecture and you stop. And there's a chance that you might get bored in the middle or you get a phone call or you get a text and you leave the lecture and, and you go. You do something else. This happens a lot. Yep. Uh, you know, something very small could distract us. A simple text can distract us and we'll leave the lecture altogether. While in person, no, but you're going to sit and listen. You're not going to leave. You're there to listen. You're there to listen to a lecture so you're going to sit throughout the whole time. I would definitely say if you can attend, if you had the choice of attending or listening online, attend the lecture in person. It's still different. You absorb more. Uh, it, s- it sticks to your mind more. You get the option of asking questions after the lecture. You get the option of meeting other mu'mineen. Every night after the lecture, we sit and we socialize for a good hour. There's brothers that sit for an hour, two hours. They sit, they socialize, they meet one another you know, they, that, that's the beauty of Ramadan. You, you don't yeah. get that online. So I would definitely say if you have the two options, choose the in-person 
in, in person uh, option. If you absolutely cannot, you're at work, you have to sleep early, you, your kids ha have to sleep early for school next day, then you, then you resort to option number two. Yeah. What do you think about the compartmentalization of information? So you have a lecture, it has a, 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 you start and you have points that build upon one another. It takes you 45, 50 minutes to complete this lecture where the points tie in, they weave into to one another. The point at the end is related to the beginning point, stuff like that. And instead, now we have compartmentalization into what is 90 second TikToks or Reels. And I'm, I'm going to be fully transparent. Like we make loads of Reels and we focus a lot on it. This clip right now of us talking is probably going to be a Reel. Um, say you're also making Reels of your lectures can, is it a bit concerning? Actually, I, I, before I ask this, I also recognize that the Sayyid also does something else where he actually put, posts the lecture in, uh, especially for the Arabi parts uh, on his channel, not the ones that he's a collaborator with us on. He posts it in a series. So he'll say like, just at one, part one, part two, part mm. three. So I guess I'm answering my own question, but generally um, there's a compartmentalization of information. So we take a, Apart, we clip it and we throw it online and it gets on the algorithm, picks up. Someone just sees a clip. Um, so small doses of information is, is obviously great, but is the, uh, it's not enough. It's not enough, exactly. And sometimes it's out of context. Um, but now that's actually the, the growing focus is on that. So we focus a lot on it. Uh, you focus, a lot of speakers focus, a lot of maracas focus, a lot of channels. Everyone is moving towards the direction of uh, reels and TikTok. So is it a sense of quantity over quality? Is there that kind of concern there? People are getting small doses of Islam, you know, small lessons here and there. Is that concerning in a way? First of all, we have to realize that our kids are on TikTok. Our kids are on Instagram and they're coming across all sorts of videos. Islamic, non-Islamic, funny stuff, music, dancing, uh, kids throwing their bottles, you know, that, yeah. <laughs> that whole uh, challenge. Um, they're being uh, confronted. I mean, they're, uh, they're seeing so much on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook. At least what these reels could do is that they counterbalance. For every five music videos that our kids, they're going to watch whether we like it or not because they're on their iPads, they're yeah. on their iPhones. There's no stopping it. There's nothing stopping them. At least for every uh, crazy videos that they watch, music videos, dancing, challenges, all that, they'll see one short clip from an Islamic lecture, something that, hit, that hits a home run, something that captures their mind, captures their soul, captures their heart, that really awakens them. It's a wake-up call. It's a way to balance it out. It's just like when we started, I know this, these whole reels, it's a new phenomenon, but lectures on YouTube, this is not new. Lectures have been on YouTube for the past decade, more, more, ever since... I, I have lectures from Muharram of, of 2011, oh, 2012. Sure. So 13, from 13 years ago, I think all of my Muharram and Ramadan lectures from 2011, 2012 were on, were on YouTube. At the time when YouTube came out, it was mostly music videos, music, dancing, just you know, stupid stuff. While now, a lot of people get their knowledge from YouTube. People converted to Islam because of YouTube. They converted to Shiism because of YouTube. Because we were able to counter all of those, uh, all of that misinformation or videos that are against Islam, against Shiism, with with lectures. And I think, I mean, the Shia community did did a fantastic job. For every music video, there was a a a a, a Shia video, a lecture on Islam on Shiism. And so there's a world of information on, on Ahl al-Bayt, on Islam, on Shi'ism, on, on YouTube. Now, we take this idea and we come to Reels on Instagram or on, on TikTok. There's so, many, there's so much junk out there that you have to counter it 
with Islamic content, whether it's tidbits from lectures, anashid, adhan, latmiyyah, uh, scenes from Karbala, scenes from Bain al-Haramain, scenes from Mecca and Medina, you have to counter it. So this is, this is one idea behind these reels. Another idea is that they serve as appetizers. Mm. They're appetizers. So it's a way to pull in your audience. You give them that 60 second, 70 second, 50 second appetizer of the lecture, whatever you're talking about, it's a way to pull them in. And then you put in the link, you want the full lecture, you'll find it on YouTube. So it's a way to pull them in. It's not meant to be the end. It's yeah. meant to be the beginning. That's the whole purpose behind the reels. It's not that, Khalas, you've done your job in 60 seconds. It's impossible. It's impossible. You can't guide people with 60-minute clips, even if you have 100 of them. But it's a way, it's meant to pull them. Come and listen to the full lecture. Come and listen to the other lectures. This is just, it's like a trailer. A trailer for a movie, for a series. It's meant to get you excited to watch the actual movie. That's the whole point behind these reels. And at the end of the day, we live in a, we live in a fast-paced world. These kids, they have their finger ready. They're just sc scrolling, yeah. scrolling. They're not going to want, unfortunately, kids today, they're just not bothered for a 45-minute lecture, for a 50-minute lecture, for an hour-long lecture. They just... The attention span is not The there. attention span is gone. They, yeah. It used to be 30 minutes. It used to be. W during the good days, their attention span was 30 minutes. Now it's After 30 minutes, you'll start to get the yawns. and Exactly. Everything. And they take out their phones and they now start checking their phones. Seven minutes in and they're falling asleep. And they're already opening <laughs> their phones. They're already on WhatsApp. They're, al they're, they're already dosing off. So we live in a fast-paced world. And you know they say, if you can't beat them, join them. If I'm you know, going to have my kids be on TikTok and on Instagram, and they look at these videos, as mine as well, put it in a couple of Islamic content for them so that it, you know, it counterbalances what they're, all the junk that they're saying at the same time. I sent them fantastic words. I, I completely agree. Um, now I just want to generally just ask you, given, considering what you just said, the role of social media uh, on, in the English world, the English member, what do you th see the future of the English member being like? In your opinion, estimating all of these things, whether yeah, the social media presence, TikTok, Instagram, um, the, the scale or uh, pedigree of the khutabat right now, what trajectory, where do you think it's headed? What do you think the future of the English member is? There is two ways to answer this question. Where should it be heading or where is it headed? Let's hear both. Let's hear both. Where is it heading now? It could be positive. It could be negative. We mentioned this in the, in, in, in the last yeah. episode that we do have a phenomena of uh, individuals taking to the member that are not very qualified. Their qualification is that they're eloquent. Yeah. They're charismatic. They know how to speak. They've heard a couple of lectures from here and there. They read a couple of hadith, and they could put they they could put on a member for a couple of minutes. But did they satisfy the needs of the communities? Today we have real problems. We have real challenges. These challenges need to be tackled by qualified scholars, qualified ulama who have who are well established in the hausa that got a quality education from the Hawza. They didn't go just for a couple of months and they came back and they say, we studied in the Hawza. No, they actually studied. They did research. They came across ulama. They benefited in the Hawza. And now they're back to tackle these issues, these problems, fix the, the problems in their communities. If we allow what's happening now, you know, there's mosques and centers, they don't question the credentials of the speaker, you know, first of all, this so-and-so alim, where did you study? Who gives you a letter of recommendation? Who can vet for you? Who can vouch for you? Who says that you've, you know, you've, you've done your studies in the Islamic seminary? A lot of times we invite speakers based on their charisma, based on their uh, quality of speaking, the, you know, they're very charismatic. 
خلاص I'm going to book him and I'm going to ask uh, are you booked for Ramadan and Muharram and I'll quickly book without asking for their credentials this yeah. is a mistake this is a mistake would we if we had a quality hospital would we bring doctors that are shady or don't have a background or might even be nurses pretending to be doctors might not even That's have not. degrees or their degrees are fake you do a full background check see we dis- we destroy that we destroy that hospital yeah. by bringing doctors that are not qualified a mosque is just like a hospital a hospital cures physical ailments a mosque and a husseiniya and a majlis cures spiritual ailments the person exactly. sitting on the member is a doctor but he's a spiritual doctor he's not a he's not a doctor of medicine but he's a doctor of spirituality i have to check for his credentials where has he studied what is he going to offer me and my kids and my community for the next 10 nights for an hour we're giving him an hour to speak whether it's ramadan or muharram so we could be heading in a in a negative direction where we encourage these speakers that have no background to to come and speak at our mosques and then our our communities don't develop we don't develop we don't grow spiritually we don't grow intellectually because of the quality of the lecture or we can make sure that these speakers get a quality education what i remember a couple of years ago i gave a lecture called google speakers and what i said in this lecture is that we should not discourage speakers that are not well grounded in the islamic sciences from speaking no Instead, as a community, if I'd like them to speak at my community, at my mosque, but he's not qualified enough, I tell him, my dear brother, go to Hawza, go to Najaf, go to Karbala, go to Qom, go to Hawza, and we'll fund you. We'll gladly fund you. Go for two years, three years, four years. Of course, the more the merrier. Yeah. The more the merrier. I'm not saying that two years is enough. Two years is not enough. But I'm trying to be practical. How many people could leave their jobs and, 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 and families and go to Hawza. Whatever X amount of years come back to us and we'll be happily, we'll happily, you know, host you here at our mosque. This is what we need. We need scholars. Now in the West, we don't need speakers. We need scholars. Center. Uh, we don't just need a speaker to come and speak for the 10 nights of Muharram and a couple of nights of Ramadan and that's it. We need quality uh, scholars that are well grounded in tafsir, in fiqh, in usul, in rajal, that are genuine scholars to come and take over our mosques and lead our communities. The Muslim community in the West is 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 not a newborn community. It's reaching its maturity. We have mature uh, communities. Uh, we have professionals in our communities, and hence we have a need not just for speakers but for scholars slash speakers that are well grounded in Islamic sciences that can come and detect the problems of our communities and fix those problems from us from well grounded Islamic lectures lectures that are well grounded in Islamic sciences from from Quran from hadith from our previous ulama from the consensus of our ulama we we need to be heading heading in that direction and I think if we do head in that direction the quality of the English member will become much higher. And eventually, there will be no room for the native languages. Because, I, and I see it even till, I see it today, that the quality of the English majlis is better than the quality of the Arabic or Farsi or Urdu lecture. The English lectures are more practical. They're more intellectual. They're more thought-provoking. Even the examples that are given, they're more, they're more practical. They're from day to day, from our day, day to day lives, while uh, some of the lectures in the in the native language, they might not be relevant. For example, some only and only discuss the fadal of ahl bayt. Of course, the fadal of ahl bayt. There's I mean, nothing greater than that. Rasbis. There's there's nothing re- greater than that. But you have a, a series of ten nights where people expect you to solve their problems, to dis- to discuss their issues and problems. You can't discuss just one topic for 10 nights um, and then expect that you've fixed uh, the, the community's problems get a few and, that's and, and that's it you feel that uh, you've done an excellent job or even in English or even in Arabic majalis where usually it's historical uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a history 
of from Bani Bani Umayyah or Bani Abbas. طيب, okay, but how do I make use of that today? How yeah. is that related to my life today? And maybe a historical lecture once in a while is fine, but a series, the whole the whole member is just history. You know, I want something about the present, about the future, something that affects my life and the life of my children, the life of my community. I think the English member should be going in that direction. Lectures yeah. that are practical, intellectual, they answer uh, our spiritual needs, our intellectual needs. There's tough questions that require uh, tough answers, you know, eloquent answers, convincing answers. That's that, that will be the role of the English member, inshallah, in the in the future. Inshallah, to deal with the real problems facing our communities, because. We've been around for 30, 40, 50 years. A lot of the problems we face here are unprecedented. In 1,200 years of Islamic history, you know, a lot of the stuff we deal with here in the West is incredibly unique. Um, whether it's a student at school or trying to raise a family in a, in a westernized world, in a liberal world, a lot of questions need to be answered. Mm -hmm. So, Ahsantum, inshallah, I believe with scholars like yourself, and like with those you mentioned, um, of course, a lot of the members of your respected family uh, being, you know, high caliber English speakers. Allah yafukum jami'an. Insha'Allah, the the ship is on the right path. Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. We hope so. Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. So I think that concludes uh, our conversation on the English member. We spoke about in the last episode and this episode about... Um, the issues with it. We spoke about how it started. We spoke about where it's going, of course. We spoke about topics, how to discuss. We spoke about having the qualifications necessary. We spoke about access to translations and English ahadith. We spoke about how the English member should be given a priority in our centers. Um, and we spoke a lot, a lot of other topics as well related to the English member. So inshallah, that was helpful uh, to the viewers, and we of course like to thank Samahat Sayyid Hussain Al-Qazwini for enlightening us on these topics. It was my pleasure and honor for for being on your show. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Sayyidna, for your uh, you know wise words and all your wisdom. So, Jazakumullah Khair. My jazak. pleasure, my pleasure. Bye. So, thank you for tuning in, everyone, and uh, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Until next time. Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Sent.